welcome youth ministers, people who love kids, people who serve kids and serve the church. Thank you for coming, and more importantly, thank you for what you do. Youth are not just the future of the church, they are the present of the church. And if you are in youth ministry, you also know this might be one of the undervalued, isolated, under-equipped parts of church life, but we take some comfort from the fact that it is by far the most fun, satisfying, fulfilling part of church life, so thank you for what you do. My name is Skip Masbach. I am the director of the Adolescent Faith and Flourishing Program here at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. All right, every single second I'm talking, I'm taking time away from maybe the leading thought generator in youth ministry in the country. Chap Clark has written something on the order of 21 books, dozens of articles. He has been in youth ministry for over 30 years. He has been a dynamic youth minister. He has been national staff at Young Life. He was called and asked by Fuller, come and create the nation's leading Institute of Youth Ministry here at Fuller and a place in which we can train not only people for youth ministry, but for PhD work and demons, et cetera. He brings not only a pastor's heart, he brings a social scientist training and PhD and scholarly understanding, and he has brought the two together in extraordinary ways. I first, uh, I first learned of Chap of Clark because you can't care about youth ministry without running into his name when I read Hurt and Hurt 2.0. This is one of those books that just changes an understanding of what's going on in our young people and in our culture and is convicting not only for how we're raising our young but also what we're doing in youth ministry. You know, one of the, one of the themes in the book is out of great love and abundance of care and investing in our kids, we have farmed out the raising of our kids to professionals in their soccer fields, in their dance troops, in their drama areas, in their SAT prep courses. Thinking we are caring for our kids, we are often in some ways abandoning our kids into places where they are prized not as children of God, not as worthy of unconditional love and acceptance, but as performers. But the part about the book that was convicting was, do we do that in youth ministry sometimes? Do we begin to look for how they can perform in their testimonies, in their witnesses, in their sharings, etc.? So it is a book that not only critiques the culture, it not only helps us understand the suffering that some of our young people experience and the way forward, but it also charts a way forward for youth ministry, both where we should be moving and caring for our children and where some of the sins are that we should try to avoid. What's so unbelievable about Chap is he brings this love of our young and this deep scholarship and um, extraordinary passion for the subject and ability to present in ways that will transform a room as we're about to experience in the next two hours. It is an unbelievable privilege that we have an opportunity to have uh, Chap Clark with us, one of, the, one of the leaders nationwide in youth ministry. I'm going to stop talking now so we can get right to Chap. Chap, thank you for coming. Thanks. Wow, nice job, Skip. There's no way I can come close to matching what he just said. So let's close in prayer. It's been a great morning. Thanks for coming. I, I, I'm on West Coast time, you guys. I live in a place called Gig Harbor, Washington. And uh, Fuller Seminary is not only in Pasadena, California. It's got campuses all over the West and South. And uh, part of my job is, is working with these remote campuses, but I get to live in any one of the places. So we unfortunately have to live in a place called Gig Harbor, Washington, which is about one of the cooler places to live. If you can't live in this part of uh, the Northeast, then Gig Harbor is not too bad. But so it's like one in the morning. And uh, Skip and I have been out partying the last couple of days, so I just uh, wanted to let you know. I'm a little sleepy, so if I'm not off in the middle of this, somebody just, would you just kind of yeah. wake me? That'd be great. And another thing is, as we get going, I'm going to do a little fire hose deal with you. I, I'm going to be giving you an awful lot of information. Now, at first, it'll seem like, uh, nah, okay, pretty obvious, okay. We're building little building bricks, you know, and putting them down, and we're going to build this kind of house of awareness and, and understanding but not just because of, of me at all. It's really just a compilation of what a whole lot of different people are saying about these things. What I bring to the table is the same exact thing you guys do. I, I got this pathological, almost nutty conviction that kids matter. And that there's something about um, looking them in the eye and, and kind of giving a rip of what's going on behind the behavior, the attitudes, the words, the dress, the style, whatever it is we encounter. And uh, I'm like you. I'm just on this journey to try to figure this stuff out. 
I, I do not presume to have the entire thing figured out by a long shot. The one thing about being in, quote, the academy is supposedly you do a lot of work and research and you tell people your conclusions. But if it actually is faithful scholarship, both theological scholarship as well as just actually work on the ground, it, it's the more work you do, the more questions you have. And so your experience with kids, are, you're going to tutor me too, and you're going to tutor each other. And that's the, the wonderful journey that I've gotten to be on with a whole lot of folks, whether or not they've had formal training or they simply have just loved, to ki loved kids for a few years. That is the game we're in. So thanks for being here and as we get going. Uh, let, let's kind of just start that a lot of people are recognizing. I, I don't know if this is true across the board for all of you here or in this uh, live stream deal, but that it's getting tougher and tougher to work with, to lead, to teach, to coach, to train, to even parent kids today. There seems to be no question about that among most people, that especially the longer you've been doing it, it's becoming more difficult. But I, I have to say that that's our perspective. We're not going to spend, at least this morning, and I don't think much of the week, we're going to spend a lot of time on what, you know, how hard it is for us as adults to care for kids. Oh, woe is us. Poor us. Those dang kids, they're a pain in the neck. They're so hard they don't live. And you know, we could do that. In fact, you'd probably have more people at those kind of conferences, right? We're, we're going to come together and complain about kids so we can support each other. Wouldn't that be, a, actually, that's a pretty good ser seminar. I'm going to go to that one, frankly. But we're not going to spend time doing that. We are not going to do our own counseling here for us. What we're going to do is we're going to look at life from their perspective. That is what I am bringing to the table as a researcher. Now let me give you kind of a little background real quick. Um, this is now 12 years ago. Uh, Fuller Seminary is, uh, uh, <clears throat> they have a very generous sabbatical policy for professors as long as you produce something. And so I had saved up these two, two quarter sabbaticals and uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, what I was going to write, work on. And this was a period for a couple of years that we were just coming out of the Gen Xers. You guys remember Gen Xers? Many of you are here. Thank you for coming. Uh, but Gen Xers were considered by everybody in the late 80s all the way through the 90s as being <laughs> awful. Frankly, remember? I mean, the, the problem with kids is they're dang, those dang Gen Xers, you know, those guys. Wait till we get the millennials. Oh, that's going to be so great. Because millennials, do you remember? Some of you have been around a while and you remember people talking about millennials. And, and this is 1998 till about 2002. All these books, I mean, a whole plethora. And I never use that word, but it's a very cool word to use right now because all these books just kind of came crashing down saying, Oh, yay, educators, yay, people in the church, yay, coaches, everybody, parents. Millennials are coming. We're going to get rid of those Gen Xers who are arrogant and disloyal and disrespectful. And the millennials are coming. And they're collaborative and they're spiritual. And they're just wonderful kids and they're, because they're the fourth turning, if you read some of the literature on this. And at the same time, I was kind of a part-time interim preaching pastor at this little church in Burbank, California. Maybe you've heard of that if you used to watch Johnny Carson. And, and I, you know, the, the pews, kids sitting in the neat rows, they wear, you know, their American Eagle at the time before Forever 21 really took off, you know, and they sat with their parents and they looked the part of a, you know, a church going kid. And they looked like, until you got kind of close up at them, like they were cream of the crop, kind of like your students. Okay. And I was involved in a little Young Life thing, an urban Young Life deal, with a, with a bunch of kids that didn't have any church background. Most of them weren't from intact families. Most of them had been oppressed by whatever social systems had tried to serve them. And they were a harder group of kids. So we get this one group of kids in this little Young Life deal who would show up occasionally when they felt like it, but you could tell they didn't necessarily trust you, but they're willing to come to your deal. So you get a little conversation with one of those kids, and it's kind of like, sure, how you doing? Good, fine. You know, and there's kind of this sheen of callous. And then I got these church kids who looked like, boy, they're collaborative and wonderful, like all the speakers and writers were saying. And then we went in this family camp with the church, and I sat around with a group of high school kids uh, right after a meal and started to kind of look in their eye and kind of ask them a question and talk to them. 
And all of a sudden I noticed something. That as soon as I could, could kind of scratch a tiny bit beneath the surface, the same exact look occurred in their eye that occurred in the kids that were in our Young Life Club eye. Where they kind of went, why are you asking me these questions? What do you really want to know? What's your angle on this thing? They wouldn't use those words. They would just use kind of, de kind of the deceptive kind of a head fake to try to keep me from getting a little too close. And I started to realize that what my colleagues and other writers and speakers were saying around the country, whether it's these specialties or in books or articles, about how wonderful and collaborative and easy and great and the good old days of youth ministry are back where you just get a bunch of kids in the room, pour maple syrup down their pants and they'll come to Jesus. And you know, they'll get confirmed and they'll actually show up the next week. Uh, was not exactly the real story. That there was something else going on. So I, I ended up doing this kind of major study that's now called the Hurt Project. We've continued ever since then. Where, where I use my own doctoral training to be what's called an ethnographer, meaning participant observer. I entered into the life of kids because uh, I wanted to try to really figure out what was going on underneath that wall of granite. And so I was a substitute teacher in a North L.A. County school for eight months. If you want to commit slow suicide, I really say that that's probably one of your best ways to go, be a substitute teacher in a North L.A. County school. Uh, and I'd have to teach every class at least, uh, I got every kid at least twice, 3,600, 3,200 kids in school. And I, you know, I have to teach chemistry. And I, I didn't, you know, do so well in chemistry, so that would take five minutes. And then the rest of the time, I could say, I'm here to write a book. Ah, uh, you are not. Yeah, actually, I am. And you get to tell me whatever you want. So the, the superintendent, the co-principals of this school, the teachers and the counselors all affirmed that I could do this research project on this campus. And the methodology was I simply wanted kids to feel safe to be able to say whatever they want to say. I wanted to hear their experience. In other words, I was treating them like an alternate population that had never been done before in social science research. The, those of you that actually read social science research in adolescence will realize we have such limited understanding of what's going on with the 11 to 18 year old because we can't get parental permission. So therefore, almost all the studies are done with college kids, which skews your results significantly. And that's what I wanted to, I wanted to hear from a 15 year old. And I wanted to know what they really thought. And after about three weeks, California, they have this deal where you go, you go two periods and then they do this 15 minutes of snack so you can grab a quick smoke. And then, then they got third and fourth period and then lunch and then fifth and sixth period. So during that snack period, it's kind of like Mean Girls, if you remember that movie, where they all sit around with their, with their different clusters in different places. And I'm sitting with this kid that had blown off third period, and he's kind of tutoring me. I've been there about three weeks. And, he, and uh, he says, we have decided, and he's speaking for 3,200 high school kids, okay, we have decided that you're okay. And I went, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And we're going to tell you anything you want to know. We're going to tell you all kind of stuff, and you're going to be blown away. Great, awesome. He goes, you know why? Tell me why. Because you're the only adult that doesn't have a hammer. And I, and I go, what do, you, what, do you, what do you mean I don't have a hammer? You're the only person that we can tell you something and you can't hurt us. Everybody else can hurt us. Coach can hurt us. Teacher can hurt us. It didn't say youth worker at a church because this kid was not a church-going kid. It had nothing to do with his faith. It was just simply the lifestyle. So we're going to tell you, and we're going to see what happens with you. And we're watching you. And that's where it started. So I was eight months on this high school campus. Themes would emerge. I'd got over a 1,000 letters, notes, poems, and songs from kids. And, and every day I'd go to my car, and the methodology required that it wouldn't be names. It would simply be male or female and grade. But I'd get anywhere from three to ten of these things a day, and I'd go sit in my car, and I... It just overwhelmed me because what I observed, what I heard from kids, what I got to uh, kind of be part of at lunch and snack and in locker rooms and at games and back of the play and all that stuff. And then these notes, the, these raw, real letters from kids. I, I, if you know the biblical reference of Moses, I, I had to take my shoes off. 
um, emotionally, it just completely shattered me. And I'm still there. Chris Smith, who's at Notre Dame, has done a lot of writing, soul searching, and others. Once we were in a panel together uh, talking about the, when The Hurt first came out, and he said, the problem with that book is you're an advocate. And if you, because you're an advocate, you wrote off your ability to actually speak into it sociologically. And I go, how can you not be an advocate when you, you hear what they're saying? I didn't, I didn't want a book called Hurt. That's a stupid name for a book. How many of you would go buy, you know, a case of Hurt for your family at Christmas time? Well, depending on your family, you know. Some of you might be, there may be some from Long Island. So, I, you know, I want to be kind of sensitive to that little piece of it. Um, then I had a team of 15 masters and doctoral students and grads that, that agreed to be on the research team. And we've had kind of a bunch of people on the research team ever since. We've been continuing the study. Uh, <clears throat> who would help code these letters and notes and my observations, and then they would read the literature and we'd argue about it once a month. And, and then we did focus groups all around the US and Canada. And that's where the themes emerged for what I'm gonna share with you today. And, and it's continued since. Her 2.0 came out two years ago because we updated the whole thing. And uh, I may not be right in the conclusions. I'm just telling you right now. But what I am gonna promise you though, I, I work hard at it. And all I'm going to invite you to do is get in a helicopter with me, okay? And go a thousand feet. And don't just think about your own family or your own students that you're involved with. But if you can take a, a bit of a micro look at where young people are, and then what does it mean to be the church in light of where young people are and how they perceive the life that we've handed them. And that's where we're going to be going today. Um, because our preparation to get them ready in a helicopter, this isn't every kid, so this is a macro analysis, but you know, I mean, to prepare them for the dangers of life, parents will want to get them ready for the dangers of life. They want to get them culturally relevant so that they can connect with others. We want to prepare them for healthy marriage and family and dating relationships down the road. So a lot of the things that parents are doing, they mean well, our coaches or teachers along the way. Uh, and still, adults, bottom line, are kind of critical kids. Uh, look at those dang fool teenagers wearing their pants hanging down low like a couple of idiots. <laughs> hey, you know the brilliance of this? It's a beautiful commentary on how ridiculously pejorative we are when it comes to people that are different than us. And when you think of kids... And when I say kids, some of you are really offended. I know somebody's going to come say something, a kid is a baby goat. One guy once said that to me. And I go, I've read that somewhere. I've heard that, you know. I, I'm old, okay? I'm somewhere between 38 and 58. Thanks for saying 35. Uh, I'm, I'm in that range now for the next few months. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, so anybody under 50 years old is a kid to me, so I'm sorry to say that, but I've been giving my life to, away to this group. But what's interesting is... Regardless of whether it's how they wear their pants or whether they wear a hat in church or uh, what they talk like when they're on the train or when they're in a movie theater, adults love to blame kids for being who they are. And bottom line, we like them when they're, we really like them when they're three if they're not our own children. They're really cute. You know, when they put the little choir robes on and play the bells like Jesus used to. And <clears throat> And then they're, then they're seven, and then they're kind of cute and kind of running around, kind of a pain, but they're kind of cute. Then they hit 11, and they're kind of a pain in the neck, but you can still tell them, stop, and they just stand there for a second. And then they go off and be 11. And then they hit 13, 14, 15, and adults stop, stop liking kids because we don't understand them. We, don't, we can't contain them. We can't control them, especially if they're in an environment where we can't get near them. It's like this population has been just kind of shoved, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So now, on your outline, you do have this thing. i, I got to get us on the same page. And, and <clears throat> I'm not going to, this is going to be the most boring, lecturish part of the whole deal, but I've got to get us on the same page of understanding what it is the heck we're dealing with in terms of history of definition of adolescence. For all of time, in every culture around the globe, there are two stages of life. We all know this. There was, there was childhood and there was adulthood. Children in every single culture in its original stages were the most precious asset of any society because they carried on the most significant legacy, which was not about money and possessions. It was about narrative. It was about communal story. 
or meta narrative, as scholars will talk about a lot. So we, the point of life in every culture in these original stages was to wake up in the morning and to live and to dance and to sing your narrative, your story. You would wake up and experience the day in community and connecting to that community. And then therefore, your legacy to pass on was this story to your kids. This is also true, obviously, of the Hebrews. Children were not seen as belonging to simply parents set apart. And this has become so ideological in our country. Uh, and and, and it's just the craziness of the rhetoric around this. But for all of time in every culture, children were, were, belonged to everybody, not just to their parents. So a, a kid would know that if it wasn't their parents, the parents represented the community to them. So they were raised and trained and nurtured and ultimately received, adopted into the adult community by everybody. So their uniqueness was identified within the context of a communal system. So therefore, until the 50s, nobody thought about the need to figure out who am I uniquely. Because your uniqueness was celebrated in the context of community. Is that making sense to you guys? Okay, so for all of time that was the case, without going into a lot of detail on this, but you look back, especially in Western Europe, the colonial period for a couple of hundred years, and then where we colonize the rest, where Western Europe colonized the rest of the world, um, there was this erosion of this understanding of what it meant to pass a legacy on to kids. In fact, life kind of began to philosophically shift in Western Europe to be more about making my mark and about an ethic of competition and finding my own sense of self and place without using that language. And therefore, kids were no longer assets, they were liabilities because they couldn't contribute to my desire to make my mark, either as a person or as a nation state. And so therefore, as children were more seen as a, a support mechanism for my agenda, that was like a little tiny snowball at the top of a Colorado mountain that started to tumble down that mountain for a couple hundred years to the point that around 1900, and this is a little bit reductionistic, but around 1900, we noticed that a shift had, had taken place in society. In Western society and Western colonized societies, where no longer were there just two stages of life, there were now three. There was a child that found its sense of self located within community and their family system, and an adult who, by definition, is interdependent, right? Connected to others, serving one another, using your gifts. In, that's the definition of society and community. And in between, there's this thing called, and they use this label, adolescere, adolescence. It's a Latin term that came out of Darwinian biology. When, when one species would evolve into another species, it would go through this little period. Uh, the Latin term was adolescere. And so they applied Darwinian theory to a shift post-child, pre-adult. And ever since then, that was around 1900, for the last 120 or 130 years, a lot of people have been studying what's unique about this that's different than children, different than adults. Adolescent, here's bottom line definition. You are responsible to insert yourself into adulthood. See, up until that time, children were received, trained, nurtured, Sometimes or, uh, uh, ceremonial rites of passage, but most often organic uh, receiving of kids. They didn't have to figure that out. The community took care of receiving kids into adulthood. But now, what adolescence has been around for about 120 years, uh, a kid basically has, has to figure out how to become an adult. So we'll say to them, what are you going to major in college? What, who are you going to marry? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do with your life? Because, see, we, yeah, we'll love you, we'll help you, we'll resource you, we'll get you ready, we'll launch you, but it's your job to figure out how to become an adult. That's the essence of what we're dealing with with adolescence. Now, let me kind of show you this. It's summarized by this word, unless your name is Carl Jung. I don't know if you've heard of Carl Jung. He played right field for the Mets for a little while. He sold women's shoes at Nordstrom's in Manhattan, as well as being a philosopher theologian. Very eclectic. Uh, couldn't get into Yale, 
Uh, so he was at other schools. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but I want to see if you guys actually have any sense of humor. So that's part of the... <laughs> <clears throat> Individuation, Jung, he, he uses it a little differently, but in counseling and actually on-the-ground psychotherapy, a lot of people use this term to talk about the process of adolescence is the process of individuation. Take off the T-I-O-N just to make it simple for you guys, okay? I'm from the West, so we need everything to be simple. Take off the T-I-O-N and put an L there. That's essentially what individuation means. The process of becoming a unique individual. And you're not done when you're an adult, as, you know, every one of us, if we're honest, we haven't quite landed, but we pretend like we've landed. That's kind of the bottom line. The really, and I hate, I never want to tell kids this because I don't want to give away our deal, but the only difference between a 60-year-old and a 12-year-old, really, let's be honest, is gravity. Okay? <laughs> all right? We are all sixth graders lost looking for our locker, <laughs> if we're honest. But see, what we learn is we learn how to kind of land and settle. This is me, yes. I'm now ready to insert interdependently, and we can work together and figure it out because we're civil people, especially in the political arena, right? <clears throat> okay. Now, what's interesting about this individuation thing is there's three basic tasks associated with it. And again, this is what scholarship has agreed to and worked on for the last five, six, seven decades, is the three tasks. Here's the first one, is identity. Uh, Eric Erickson was the one that really made a big deal about this. Maybe you remember him. He, he found America, okay? His uncle, Leif, heck, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> but 1950-ish to 60s, we had to figure out what, what does it mean to move from childhood to adulthood? And what do you have to do? You've got to differentiate. Okay, differentiation you'll hear in counseling settings. You've got to figure out your own uniqueness so that your unique person can connect to others and you've got something to bring to the table. That's identity. And then you got people like James Marcia who talks about the choices you make through life and the path you go through will ultimately form you. So identity formation became the way that developmental psychologies talked about it. I want to throw in a little theology since we are at Yale Divinity School. Theologically, though, there's also a particularity to, to the human person. There is an affirmation for both the need and the call of God to love one another and to live in community and to care for neighbor and environment. But there's also an affirmation to recognize my uniqueness and particularity. That there's both particularity and community affirmed throughout Scripture and church tradition. So this idea of identity is... is become more and more prominent in an individualistic Western society that Erickson started to talk about and a whole lot of others, but really it's kind of for us, it's identity discovery as much as it's identity formation. And here's what's important about that, is when you're working with young people who are not children anymore because their identity is located within their family system as a child and they move into adolescence, there is this sense of, trying to figure out who am I in the midst of all of this. And here's the problem. In our culture, we define ourselves, we're trained to define ourselves according to how well we contribute. And, and, and Skip mentioned it, the performance thing. Is well, your kids, if they're good at soccer when they're five, fifth grade, then they're, they're pushed into seeing their sense of self located with their ability to kick a soccer ball. And so their identity then becomes connected to their performance. So we have even taken it in the Western world as vocation is what we're good at and where we get a paycheck. And yet the human person longs for something deeper. And that's the quest. Your kids are wanting to know, do you care about me, the soccer player? Do you care about me, the student? Do you care about me, the, the superstar uh, church-going kid that's committed to your ministry? Or am I somebody who is actually beneath that ability to perform and conform? That's identity. Second task is autonomy. And what's really funny about this one is uh, <clears throat> autonomy is almost always talked about in our society. 
uh, and, and a guy named Jeff Arnett and actually Chris Smith from Notre Dame have written some things on this where we were late being responsible with being autonomous. The problem is responsibility may or may not be a reflection of an internal growth and autonomy. Here's what autonomy actually means. It's not about the choices I make. It's the source of those choices. See, most, mo most moms or stepmoms, you know, and a lot of males don't typically do this, but in our culture, a lot of females who are nurturers do this. As they'll say to a kid, you know, love you, okay, get to school, whether they're third grade or tenth grade. And they say, two, two things, don't forget these two things. Be yourself and make good choices. And, and, you know, third grade goes, okay, and they don't have any idea what it means, so it's fine. They just run out. It's just blah, 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 okay, and I'm gone. You look at the face of a 10th grader after they've heard that for the 10,000th time, and they, be yourself and make good choices. Okay, got it. And they walk away going, you have no idea. Be myself. Which self do you want me to be? Do you want me to be the self that you want me to be? Do you want me to be the self my math teacher wants me to be? Do you want me to be the self that my pastor wants me to be? Uh, and make good choices. What you really mean, you don't want me to make good choices. You want me to make the kind of choices that are going to keep the vice principal or the sheriff from calling the house. You want me to make a choice that doesn't cause you a hassle. You don't want me to develop an inner sense of control of my life and move through life by making a lot of mistakes, pushing the boundaries as I attempt to decipher how am I unique, what kind of power do I have? Because actually, autonomy developmentally is much more about power and the place of power and voice. Every one of these precious kids that God has given us to serve has been given this sense of agency and power innately. That's, that's the amazing gift of life we've been handed. And see, interdependency in adulthood and community and church are all predicated on individuals accessing their own sense of agency. In other words, a kid's got to believe that they have something to offer. But if they spend their whole life trying to somehow adapt to all the expectations of every adult around them, whether it's parents or teachers or coaches or people in the church, then they're not actually developing an inner locus of control. What they're developing is the ability to hand control over to adults. The problem with that is it's a house of cards, right? Because eventually they're not going to be able to make their own decision, especially if they go to college. And a lot of the kids represented in this room those kids end up going to college. And they, if they haven't been taught internal autonomy, if they don't have a sense of voice and self to bring to the table, then they, they don't know what to do. Because who do they listen to and respond to? And thirdly, the task is belonging. Is Does anybody care about me or do they care about me, the performer? Me, the kid who's good looking. Me, the kid that's a good student. What happens when I push against? What happens when I fail? What happens if I'm a victim or a perpetrator of violence? We are really concerned as a society now about bullying, but the only thing we're talking about is how do we defend the victims? How come we're not asking deeper questions about a society that produces bullies? These are still children. These are our kids. They belong to all of us. And these bullies have been... They've been, they've been victimized by society because at 14 they've already been written off. And these are just kids. Does anybody care? See, these three tasks. Now, here's the thing about all of us here. You kind of look at that and go, and if you're, if you're even moderately healthy, and, you know, I did a survey coming in, 37.2% of you, you know, are. That's really good. And the rest, we have therapists at lunch that'll be at each table. You won't know who they are. <laughs> They'll just be listening, kind of watching. All right. But if you're moderately healthy, you go, uh, okay, identity, who am I? Man, i I got to figure that one out. Autonomy, am I just adapting to other people's expectations, or do I actually have voice here? And I, am I respected as an as a interdependent member of whether family, church, life, neighborhood? And then belonging. Where's my community that cares about me? Belonging where uh, somebody gave a definition when I was graduating from college. I was in this little dinky startup church and the pastor was, they were doing a little, you know, yay for the senior graduating, which was, that was it. Okay, so I'm there. And, uh, and he said, this church is home because home by definition is the place when you show up, they got to take you in. 
and act the time. I thought, oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Okay, you got to take, all right, we'll take you in, doggone it. But for us as adults, we kind of look at that and go, wow, I, I'm still working on those things. I, I got to figure those things out. Well, here's the deal. The difference between us and developing adolescence is we have life experience, relational uh, opportunities to be able to read the cues around us and to begin, uh, not to begin, but to work on those things through the rest of the lifespan. What, what individuation is about for adolescents is they don't have life experience to be able to navigate this and nobody's talking about this stuff. All we're telling them is, we love you, did you clean your room? How come I got that call yesterday? I thought you were doing fine in school. And uh, yeah, but I just need to just chill for a little while. I appreciate chilling, but we, we need to talk about the school thing. How are you doing in sports? How come you didn't start last week? And we go down the list of the different ways that we expect kids to externally perform their way individuation. And then it's the, where's all this timing? How, you know, how does adolescence work? It begins in puberty. The average age of puberty, when your body changes, you get a lot of you know, hair, you look kind of weird. And then it ends when you kind of landed, when any society and culture where you kind of settle into adulthood until finally you become a senior pastor or a high school football coach. Okay, that'd be the... I need goofy slides, okay? I don't have much content, so therefore... <clears throat> it's the average age of puberty in any culture. And now scholars are studying this and have really ramped this up the last 40 years or so. We're realizing it's the average age of female puberty in a culture, within a few months on either side of that average age of that first menses, that's when both the boys and girls begin this thing called adolescence. It's a psychosocial dynamic. That didn't used to be one word. About 20 years ago, even in, in spell check in your computers, that's when that became one word. Because it has to do with this. It's a process where psychologically, uh, how I see myself, how I interact with myself, how I perceive my ability to interact with my community. That's the psychology of adolescence. Sociology is, how do I read the cues from others in the environment? And here's why it's psychosocial as a process. Puberty, excuse me, I just hit it. Uh, it's because this is a constant interaction. I'm constantly reading the cues as I'm growing up, and I'm constantly trying to read the internal cues of who I think I am. And I'm in dialogue with who I think I am and who other people say I am and how I can connect to them. See, adolescence is not physiological. It's not about body changes. Your body changes much more from birth to five than it does from 13 to 18. It changes a lot 13 to 18, but nothing compared to zero to five. What changes is you hit 14 or so, all development is stage Piaget. Maybe you've heard of him, a French guy that studied his three kids and became famous. That's absolutely true. And you got Piaget talking about these stages. They all work until they're about 14. Then you got Erickson talking about stages, a guy named Kohlberg who studied moral development. Stage theory worked really good. A guy named James Fowler who studied faith development worked through. Then you got uh, Yoda, Sarah Palin, some of the great developmental stage <laughs> thinkers. Up until 14, it does work according to chronology. Once it hits about 14, it's no longer physiological. Development comes about the environment and how I read my environment. It becomes about relationships and attachment. And all the brain studies are telling us this too. Why is that so important? Because you guys, we in the church, we in the society have to realize that kids are trying to figure all this stuff out, this individuation thing. And they don't get it. And somehow, when the average age of puberty, they all begin this journey of individuation. So let me show you what the literature says it looks like historically. Up until 1900, average age of females in the U.S. and looks like around the world for all of time was somewhere between 14 and 15. That's when females, on average, would hit menses, as best as we know. What's interesting about that is brain researchers and also people that study uh, historical development, uh, for example, study development of people 500 years ago or 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago, have determined that it's been relatively fixed that the brain shifts from child brain, which is very concrete, to 
Sorry, I just, I just love dancing when I hear music. I was a dance minor if you couldn't figure that out. There's no <laughs> Pretty good, huh? That's all I'm doing for free. Ten bucks, I'll show you the whole show. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but what's interesting about the brain is shift, 14 or 15, we move from concrete, receiving information, storing information, accessing information. That's, that's the childlike brain. And then right around 14 or 15, the brain begins the process of abstraction. And so it's interesting, for all, it looks like for all of time, the brain would mature at around 14 to 15, and the body would mature somewhere around 14 or 15. So that means the child would be a child in both brain and body until about 14 or 15. Then brain and body would begin to have the adult-like abilities. And then you can see in antiquity, and even 200 years ago, you can find examples of fully developed adults at 17 years old with all the mature capability. Ships captains at 17. Uh, the, the head of the Siberian, I just read about this last week, Siberian fleet of Russia in 18, I think it was 40 or 1860, was 19 years old. He's the head of the entire Russian fleet there. And by the time he's 24, he was a millionaire. This guy that started the Inglenook uh, winery he, because he had full brain function. And th there's so much evidence of that, right at 14 or 15. When were you an adult in 1900 when we first noticed this? Here's what's interesting. 1900, 1% of American high school age kids went to what we consider high school. Only 1%. 9% went to prep schools. So 10% went to some kind of education after 8th grade in the U.S. in, nine, nine, in 1900. Only 1% of them went on to what we consider kind of the public typical high school. Because we saw education as finishing at around 14. Why? Because you're an adult at about 14. You were a young adult, but you were seen that way. But when scholars looked back, we didn't start studying this till the 20s and 30s, but when we look back and apply individuation to development, what we see is in 1900, our kids were not really mature adults interdependent until they're about 16. And so that's when we first gave the label adolescent and first started to notice this. Now let's jump to the 1970s, 1980s. Average age female puberty in the US dominant culture dipped below 13 for the first time in that decade. That is when all the boys and girls on average went below uh, 13 years old. So this had gotten a little bit younger. Now, if you're 35 and older, this is the, kind of the shift, is you were an adult according to individuation, 18 to 20. So if you're roughly 50 and older, right around when you graduated from high school, if you did, you kind of landed and settled and, and individuated right around 18 years old, right about time of, of high school. If you are somewhere between 35 and 50, it was a year or two after that when you kind of settled in. This, remember, identity, this is who I am, autonomy, I have an internal locus of control. I make my own choices and I live with those choices. Belonging, I'm ready to be interdependent with adult community, right? Now, if you're 35, and we'll, we'll take Q&A in a little while, but that's kind of how it's seen. If you're 35 and younger, a huge shift, because this is like that snowball, again, coming down the mountain, and then right around the mid-90s, things started to really change exponentially. And that's where we went to today, where the average age female puberty in our culture, according to Center for Disease Control, is 12. If you have the data in a calculator, it's about 11.7 dominant culture. If you are Latino immigrant in, in Los Angeles, it's about 11.3. If you're wealthy in South America in urban centers, it might be about 11.1 or 11.0. Let me tell you some other things on this one. It, it, interesting on this one, it's not just environment, education, socioeconomic standards. Uh, in our culture, what doctors say, you know, if you ever gone to a pediatrician, what would a pediatrician tell you? Anybody know? Nutrition. Nutrition. It's hormones in the food supply. They've been saying exactly the same thing for 35 years, even though organic foods supposedly have kind of crept in. But here's some studies that you don't hear about, and they're very solid. Do you know that a girl that reports a close affective relationship with her father, on average, hits her first menses six months later than a girl that reports an estranged relationship from her father? 
Six months. If you've taken any statistics class, you know that that is incredibly significant. In fact, it's frighteningly significant. Six months is huge in terms of this. There are so many environmental factors that affect this, and I, we're not going to fix this, but I, this is where the limits of my, I don't study this stuff, I'm just kind of reporting to you, it's getting younger, we all know that, it's getting younger around the globe, there's all kinds of reasons for it, but this is serious. Now, when are you an adult today? I swear to you, this is not my list, this is just the, this is the synthesis of journals out there. Scholars are saying, if we define adolescence according to identity, autonomy, and belonging, individuation, and not timing, this is what scholars will say. For women, it's mid to late 20s now. On average, now there's outliers. For men, mid to late 50s. That sucker goes on and on. <laughs> we call it PlayStation, Xbox, and Will Ferrell. That's what that's all about. Now, it's extended. Here's some implications of this. Again, it's on average. I'm getting you in a helicopter. There are fully mature adults at 23 but they are clearly outliers. There are people in their 30s and 40s and 50s who have not quite individuated for a whole variety of factors. Becoming an adult who's interdependent and is relatively individuated is becoming more difficult, especially for males in our culture, than ever before. Then you add to that environments of violence, uh, family struggles, educational or economic oppression. I mean, you could just go down the list. And all of these exacerbate the extension of adolescence. And here's one thing to know on average. This doesn't mean every kid, but on average, today's 23-year-old is the developmental equivalent of a 17-year-old 25 years ago. That's the way to get this. Today's 23-year-old is the developmental equivalent of a 17-year-old 25 years ago, on average. It doesn't mean every kid's that way. But here's the deal, is almost everybody in high school is somewhere in the middle of this process. Where, especially the older we are, the more we go, hey, I remember. I know what life is. And we tell kids, high school's the best time of your life. Parents say that to kids all the time. You're such a complainer. What a whiner. High school's the best time of your life. Whenever an adult says that to a kid, have you ever seen a look on a kid's face? They're going, Oh, awesome. Thank you. I, that's great. I appreciate that. That's great. So what you're telling me is this is as good as life gets. <laughs> Thank you. That's really a gift. Okay, great. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Free fall and I'm free fall. Okay. <clears throat> well, all, that said, I, when you walked in this room, how many of you had said you were an adult at 16? Anybody? One. Okay. On average, kids are adults at 16. Okay. How many say 18? Okay. A few more of you. How many say 21? Oh, that's the marker because alcohol. And where I live in Washington State, it's now pot, unless you have ever been in college, and then pot is whenever you feel like it. Uh, how many would say, what's interesting about that is we have these markers, and everybody kind of goes, hey, 16, hey, 18, hey, 21. What's interesting that we got these markers, okay, 16 is... That is the one marker, it's the one rite of passage we have that's the most dangerous. You're given the most opportunity to do the most damage at 16 years old, which is a little frightening. But uh, then we say 18 because, right, you can vote, you can go to war, and you can use tobacco products unless you play baseball, and then it's seven. Okay? <laughs> and then 21 to drink alcohol, or if you live in Colorado and Washington, to smoke pot legally, right? And, uh, but see, the airline industry, I mean, the, the uh, rental car industry, right? Hertz says it's 25. They got their, you know, 25, you're an adult. Okay, what about uh, Southwest Airlines? Two. <laughs> well, it, it's so funny how we have all these different numbers. And a lot of parents go, you know, 18, boy, until you're 18. And we say it with, you know, with, with a smile on our face. Till you're 18, I love you, you're great. But as long as until you're 18, I'm yours. Okay, you belong to me, and you do exactly what I say until you're 18. Parents that say that to their 11-year-old think they're getting away. That 11-year-old stores that, remembers it, writes it down, has the calendar. <laughs> Tattoo artists love that. Because they go, kids go in, the day they turn 18, they go to the tattoo parlor. They know that they get the Zelda right across their chest, you know. And come back and say, I'm 18, I got it's Zelda. You know, and this is... And this, they don't know cause and effect, and this is called permanent, you know. Uh, 
But this is serious because, you know, guys also get tattoos. It's not just the girls. So, uh, <clears throat> And I like to describe this in terms of stages because this gives a kind of a picture. This helps me to understand what it is we're dealing with with young people. Is uh, uh, We started studying really around the 30s. We started studying this whole thing called adolescence in depth and detail till the mid-90s. The left pole is the pole of childhood, the right pole is the pole of adulthood, where you have support on both sides, community, right? By definition, adolescence is therefore a tightrope because you have to go through it alone. You can't individuate, you can't have somebody else. Now, you, you know that you got the helicopter parent who hovers over the kid knowing that that kid still is responsible to figure out how to how to move along. In fact, scholars are now talking about other kinds of parents, not just helicopter parents, but they have the snowplow parent, right, that tries to push away any kind of obstacle. Uh, they commit fraud by writing their kids' college entrance exam uh, or having SAT tutors. Ooh, sorry, that was a oh, low blow. Although it's called a standardized test that if you're wealthy, you can work the system. That's the integrity of that. Let's not talk about it, okay? Uh, and what's interesting about that whole thing is the snowplow parents actually think if I can get all obstacles out of my kid's life, my kid's going to do better. But the reality is you can't ever prepare the road for the child. You got to prepare the child for the road. And, and, and therefore, as we try to push aside all the problems they're going to face, they don't ever learn how they're going to interact with life as they grow up. They won't develop a sense of self and autonomy. But then there's the stealth fighter bomber parents. I love those. You guys ever encounter those in youth work? They kind of come out and they're mad, but you don't know it until they come out of nowhere and just drop napalm and just boom, you know. Uh, the drone parents are coming, and I'm not sure what they're going to do, but that's a whole other political thing. Okay, here's the process of what happens during adolescence. So those of you, we're all here doing youth work. It's just really important we understand developmentally where the kids are. Why? Because you can't separate spiritual development from human development. You can't s separate a kid's uh, internal conviction to trust the God of tradition, whatever tradition you come from, in a way that's separate from their own developmental journey in terms of them owning their own life, seeing themselves as an agent, etc. These are intrinsically related. We, have, we actually think that you can be a goofball kid at 17 who's going to make, you know, who's, who's just in the midst of this transition, and yet at 17 in the church be this amazing 45-year-old uh, adult. And we actually think that that can happen. The problem is what they'll end up doing, we'll talk about this a little bit later, and Skip kind of referred to this when he introduced me, is that they will play to the expectations we have and they will say that kid's amazingly mature when actually they just are a more skilled adapter than other kids, which actually stifles their own personal faith journey because they're not able to go, I don't know if I think that. And I struggle with that. I don't understand that sermon. That's a stupid sermon. I, how do, I need to have somebody talk to about this stuff and to allow themselves to have their own developmental journey attached to their faith journey. So here's how it works on this. As puberty has gotten younger, and this is from the 30s to the 90s, and this is where the brain still shifts, around 14 to 15. That's called an early adolescence. So when you read about early adolescence, here's their deal. This is how you understand early adolescence. I have the brain of a child and the body of an adult. Okay? brain of a child and the body of an adult. This is where boys and girls and males and females are at their most different across the whole lifespan, according to the brain researchers and developmental thinkers. And Nancy Chardro and Carol Gilligan are two that studied under Eric Erickson, and they've done identity stuff, especially with females. And what we've learned about girls from who are uh, prepubescent, that's a child. Even if a kid doesn't hit puberty, male or female, till 14, it doesn't matter if their community hits it at 12, all right? What matters is the psychosocial community. They all move into this, and they're called early adolescence. And for females, early adolescence is this. Their brain moves at the, at the rate of a Japanese bullet train, just shoom! 
And all the studies have shown us that the, the speed at which the female brain from 11 to 14 goes, and it's all about reading cues. In fact, Nan, uh, Carol Gilligan from Harvard, uh, she couldn't get into Yale, you know, so she had to go up there. Uh, or UC San Diego, my alma mater, okay, either one. Uh, but she said the 11 to 14-year-old female is the most relationally intuitive human on the planet. Okay? She said that in a conference. The most relationally intuitive human on the planet. And you think about the 11 to 14-year-old girls that you guys deal with. Okay? Their brains are moving so fast and looking for cues. It's like... It's like you watch Discovery Channel and, and the deadliest catch is already over and you're just it's still on and they find this, uh, this new organism at the depth of the Pacific Trench and it's beautiful and it's got these two huge antennae and the antennae are just going ooh. That's the 11 to 14 year old female, okay? And all these antennae are just going ooh and asking one question, do I like you? Do you like me? Do you like everything about me? And do you like my friends? And they're just constantly moving. Like, Any of you ever work with 11 to 14 year old girls? Yeah. Okay, just, if you picture the antenna on all, every time you see them, next time you go to see them at church, you just let, and then just picture these antenna and wrapping around each other and using them as offensive weapons sometimes, and you got it. The boys are really, this is where the brain moves very differently. It's th their brain uh, actually is, is also like a train. Yeah. But it's more like, you know, the little engine that never should have tried. That never should have tried in the first place. It's like if you go to a middle school, is school out of session here yet? Are you guys still in school? Okay, if you really want to test this, I love it. Go, go and do a little research project and write and chat and say, chap, I, well, I did a research project. Go to a middle school and you'll watch the parents, the nannies, the chauffeurs, uh, you know, Hummer or 88 Plymouth Voyager, depending on their denomination. Okay, uh, <laughs> driving up and sitting, and they'll come 45 minutes, an hour and a half early if they have a middle school boy because they want to park right in front because the girls will come running out with their antenna just going like this, no problem. The boys think Shrek in sixth grade, okay? <laughs> and the boys will come out, and they'll come out with about 85-pound backpacks, these little tiny sixth, seventh grade boys, right? You, you know why? Because they don't remember anything from 10 minutes ago. <laughs> So when they go at the end of the day, oh, i got to get my books. Okay, so they open their locker, they shove every book because they don't know what they have for homework. Then if there's an open locker, they grab those books. Maybe I should. And they, and they come out, they go like, that's it, right? If you got 11 to 14-year-old boys in church, they had to bat, and they come walking out, and there's a car right there, and the mom going, Jeremy, Jeremy. And he's, and then he finally sees mom, yeah, he takes the backpack, oh, throws it in the car, gets in, and she goes, hi, how was your, where are your shoes? <laughs> and the kid goes, I don't, did I have two when I left? I don't remember. Oh, mom, I forgot my backpack. And he runs, and the backpack's there in the front seat. That's the 11 to 14-year-old male. <sighs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's really not supposed to be funny. It's just so dang true. That's what's kicking it. Yeah, right. So when you go to camp with an 11 to 14 year old boy, and he's just having this great time, crazy, you know, and then they feed sugar at camp. Can you believe what? Because at middle school camps, what we do is we, we we photocopy the schedules from high school and we apply them to middle school kids, not realizing they need 11 hours of sleep. They shouldn't have any food products, especially sugar or white flour. Uh, after 7 o'clock at night, and we ought to put them in bed at 9 o'clock at night, and, but instead we keep them up to 11. But that kid's just wild, and you, he's great at lunch, and everybody's like, oh, let's go play Frisbee, woo! Okay, and then all of a sudden the kid kind of walks out of there going, and you just, it's, like the, it's like a zombie movie, all these 6th and 7th grade boys. And then they say, where's, where's Jeremy? Oh, I think he's in the cabin, and there's this 6th and 7th grade boy. If you've ever counseled or been a leader to middle school boys, He's laying in a fetal position in his cabin, but he doesn't know why. And you come in, Jeremy. Yeah. You all right? I don't know. <laughs> you want to play frisbee? I guess so. Come on, here we go. You pull him out of bed. Yay! And there, he, and there, the girls are a little. If they go, they all go together and text each other while they're hiding. They're not. They're, they snuck their phone in. Here's the deal. Both males and females during this period
do not have the developmental capacity for reflection and abstraction. They simply have to deal with what's, what's right in front of them. Females react to it immediately and then react to the next thing immediately and are just constantly bopping through these things. But they're asking one question. Am I safe? Do you like me? Can I simply be myself as I read these cues because I'm so worried of what people think of me? This is why middle school is so destructive to so many girls. Because they're constantly just bumping into each other and scraping against each other. And then they make alliances and they'll do just these horrid things to one another. Boys, they're asking the same question, it's just their brain moves so much slower. See, both, this is where your best people have to be your leaders for your 11 to 14 year old kids. Your fifth through eighth grade kids have to have people that recognize they're so in, incredibly vulnerable. Not bad to have high school students work with middle school kids, but they got to have adults present because high school boys will at least intuitively hit on those middle school girls that look like they're 18. There's a few of them, right? And it, your best guys are still going to succumb to flirting, at least subtly, but those girls can read those cues just like that. And not only the girls that are receiving it, but all the other girls go, how come I'm not receiving it? And then the body image stuff and the objectification that takes place, it starts when they're very, very young. And they're so vulnerable, middle school kids. The fifth to eighth graders are so incredibly vulnerable because they don't have the capacity for reflection, abstraction, the gray areas of life. Now, <clears throat> up until this period, this is called late adolescence, uh, up until the mid-90s, from when the brain begins to shift from concrete to abstract, it still takes, at that time, it took a few years, anywhere from three to five years, for the brain to fully integrate and become an adult brain, probably around 18 to 20 years old if you're 35 and older. Here's the definition of a late adolescent. Abstraction is, do you remember this period in your life? Think of how you talked, thought about your parents. It's where you would tell your parents when you got exasperated with their stupidity, where you go, you know what, I, I get it, I know everything. If you need help, I'd be happy to sit you down and talk to you about it, but you guys are the ones that have the problem. I got this thing wired. In fact, I'm pretty upset because you haven't paid the three grand for my Europe trip this summer. And you're a little bit late on my parking tickets and you need to get at it, okay? Because you're the one that's really responsible, but I've got life figured out. It's a time in life when you are sort of responsible, but you haven't really owned it yet. That's late adolescence. Okay? Abstract, concrete. Well, somewhere between the mid-90s and mid-2000s, this thing extended, as we've talked about. What became evident, and the brain studies are confirming this, it takes a good solid 10 years for the brain to fully... Um, develop into a, a mature adult brain. Now, it takes about 10 years. This to mid-20s is a brain function related to attachment and communal relationships. We'll talk about that later. As, as adolescence has lengthened, this has not changed. The brain still goes from concrete to abstract. So if you're 35 and younger, this is more what you have experienced. And this is still the brain, this is concrete to abstract. But from here to here is the 10-year abstraction period of your brain becoming more and more functional. What's interesting is the first thing the brain matures in is things like chemistry and physics and logic. But the last thing that forms is social intelligence and cause and effect. In other words, I can't really read cues well. I don't have a sense of empathy yet. I, that's the last thing to develop in the abstract brain forming. And so that happens during what's called late adolescence. And there's another term for it now I'll talk about it in a minute. So what happens between 14 and 20? If you're doing high school and young college, this is your stage. Here's the label that I've used. Egocentric abstraction. Egocentric abstraction says this, I'm now aware because I, my brain has shifted towards the ability for abstraction, I'm now aware that I impact others by my behavior and attitude, but I don't care. Yeah. Now, I tell you, I say that and sometimes people don't know enough about me to think I'm just being mean to kids, that I'm blaming them. 
that is where I started with you guys. Adults blame kids for being insolent, for being disrespectful, for not really caring how their behavior and their attitudes, especially collectively with people that are strangers. If you go to a movie theater and you walk behind a group of 15 or 16 year olds, you may even, though know, you work with kids, you may be astounded and offended. And almost every adult is. You see, you're on the train with them or whatever. It's because this is a period where you don't know who you are, you're not sure what kind of power or voice you have, and you don't know who cares. So therefore, you're going to be focused on your own self-protection. David Elkine wrote a book called The Hurried Child in 1981 that he redid in 92, redid in 2001, came out again in 2006, 25th anniversary, The Hurried Child, where he predicted all of this before it even happened. He saw what we were doing to our kids was forcing them into a kind of an egocentrism out of the stress of not knowing who they were and how to grow up. And that was David Elkind. I'll talk about that at the after the break. But that's mid-adolescence. And I, I want you to know that there's hardly anybody that's putting together what mid-adolescence is and especially applying it to a ministry situation. It's not happening much in education. It's definitely not happening in the government. Almost nobody's putting together all the literature. This is a summation of literature that's out there. This is what the Hurt Study was. I was trying to figure out what are these guys saying about the life we've handed them? What is their experience? Because they haven't yet matured to the point of being able to abstractly interact into the nuances of adulthood or even late adolescence. So we are dealing with a group of kids that are trying to figure out every day they wake up in the morning, how do I discover who I am, what kind of power I have, and does anybody care in a world that is expecting me to perform and conform? And that's mid-adolescence. Now, then Jeffrey Arnett, who's a professor, I forgot what school, Clark University maybe, uh, he came up with a new term called emerging adulthood, which actually is a fourth stage of life that's relatively new, that says that, uh, well, college students are not necessarily late adolescents because that actually is mean. He put that in his first book. I don't want to insult college kids, so I don't want to call them adolescents. Well, that's hard to continue to study the same phenomenon. We change the name. It just kind of changes the game. But it's called emerging adulthood going into the early 30s. Those are the, stage, uh, the, the stages. Now, I'm going to take a minute. Four questions of everything I've done, and we'll take a little break. Then we're going to do the fun stuff. Just as a quick question, um, when you're talking about this, how the stages are changing and developing, my concern is, is that we have an institutional expectation. You had said like a 23-year-old today is a 17-year-old 25 years ago. So how is that impacting when we're diagnosing children as having attention deficit or hyperactivity issues, when actually it's simply a developmental, not delay, but a developmental change? That's Does that make sense? brilliant, absolutely, and it's a problem. It's a huge problem. It, it's, it's not only with, with things like childhood diseases, like, uh, or diseases, yeah, I guess I should say that's in the DSM-5, um, <clears throat> like ADHD. It's like narcissism and schizophrenia when unbelievable difficult to diagnose a 14-year-old with schizophrenia. Uh, there obviously are chemical things that go on and environmental issues that need to be attached uh, to certain kids for whatever reason, but I believe that our medical professionals and our psychological world needs to be thinking differently about the sociological, sociological realities. And in my experience, that rarely happens. Uh, I, what I try to tell people in my classes and everywhere I go and do seminars and stuff is never let a child or adolescent take any chemicals, any drugs for any diagnosis without family counseling as a part of the package because it always has an environmental impact. There's, there is an environmental piece to it, even if there's a chemical reality. But it, it's, a, it's a huge issue, because um, we're siloized in our academy. And medical professionals and psychological professionals often don't actually read or interact with other people that study this kind of stuff. So thank you. One or two more, and then we've got to take a break. Uh, we're running into an interesting um, 
phenomenon across youth ages in our parish where we're really trying to push the envelope in terms of the, the very young kids doing a lot of meaningful roles on the altar or in ushering or and they love it you know you got a six-year-old or a nine-year-old you know who who can do this but we're getting some real pushback from the older teens who in fact are sort of much more conservative about this stuff and saying you know what th those kids are really uh, awkward at that or they don't do that very well and you really should have some norms where they have to be completely prepared before they do thus and such. So it's, it's a real interesting back, it's sort of like creating some of these much looser informal services and expecting the older teens to come and they're not at all interested in that. So some of the, the adults are more interested in the informal services than the, than the older youth are. I, I think that actually is a great problem because there's a little bit of ownership in that deal. Just in, in general, in including young people in the life of a church, up until they begin hitting adolescence, they don't have a developmental need to actually participate other than their presence. Developmental need, once they hit about 10 or 11 years old, though, from then on, they developmentally need to participate in order to be part of. So that, that's just an important thing to keep in mind. It's a nice, cute thing to have children involved, and it's fine. But it is a necessary thing to have from the 10 or 11 on to feel a sense of connection to the community. So, yeah, one more. Kat. So I don't, you might get into this later, I'm thinking kind of in terms of more of application. And it, systematically in the church, we teach rules. We teach behavior expectations, which sounds like that's going completely against, auto like, in a sense, I'm like, can we ever be completely self-autonomous because we learn how to adapt to things and ultimately to be interdependent adults, we need to conform to some sort of norm. And yet we have teenagers who don't, they resist conforming to that. And so what would you recommend in terms of application, in terms of how we yeah. do, I mean, do we, do we teach rules? Do we, how do we, what would you encourage us to do in terms of what we teach and how we lead these okay, teenagers? That's a great question. And in, in terms of adults, for society to work, r roles and expectations need not just to, we need not just to conform to them, we need to own them internally. And if for society to actually function, we have to own these decisions ourselves to say we are going to put limits on ourselves in order to serve interdependently, to live interdependently in society. We have to agree that a red light means stop. Okay? And that's why we have, there's, there's a lot of uh, pushback against that, and that's why we have police force, et cetera. Uh, for, but for an adolescent or a child, we have to teach them how to internalize, not conform, but to internalize the choices in order to be productive members of society. And that's the dance. And I call it boundaries. As opposed to pu uh, punitive measures that hurt a kid, we need to train a kid. In fact, the word discipline has been, uh, the biblical word discipline has been used to, to kind of connote punishment and to hurt a kid so they won't do it again. Our whole justice system is based on you've got to hurt somebody. If they've done something bad, you hurt them back. And that supposedly teaches them not to do it. It's the worst form of motivation is punitive. Uh, the best form is uh, relational reconciliation and affirmation of their participation in the community and teaching them how to have boundaries on the inside. It's training. The biblical word in Greek and in Hebrew that's used 90% of the time in Greek and Hebrew is not punishment, it's training. It's more like a coach of, of fourth grade football defensive backs. Now maybe not all of you have seen a football game, but most of you have at least seen a football game at some point. And a coach of a fourth grade team usually is in, in practice games is standing in the backfield. And when a kid makes a mistake because they go for a fake, then a punitive measure or an imp is, is you stand there and you follow that, you know, in that kind of control and the kid never owns it. As opposed to the coach getting, hey, stop a second. Hey, here's what happened. That, that quarterback faked that guy and then he ran this way and you went for the fake Here's, let's talk about this. Why don't you watch the quarterback and watch the ball, and if he fakes it, you still go with that ball, and I'm going to stand behind you, 
and whisper into you, watch the ball, watch the ball. And then the next time, let's run it again. Then the kid learns because the coach has taught them how to internalize the behavior that actually can, can promote growth. And that's really what we have to do. We provide boundaries and internalized behavior, but we get the kids to own any conformity as opposed to we just impose it on them. So when you impose rules that they don't own, you're actually shutting down their own growth in terms of autonomy. Here's the bottom line that I understand why this has all happened. And I've alluded to it already before is an exponential loss of social capital from those who are necessary in the lives of our kids. Social capital is this concept that's made popular by a guy named Robert Putnam, a professor of sociology at uh, Harvard, wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And uh, a lot of people have talked about social capital. Here's basically what it comes down to, is people invested in the lives of young folks in order for them to explore who they are as they prepare to enter adulthood. It's, uh, scholars have known for an awful long time that you cannot become an adult unless you have a bunch of adults surrounding you. You just can't. You can't figure out what's going on on the inside and how to interpret all the messages of life unless you have uh, people to help you interpret what's going on out there in the world. And not by forcing you into conformity and performance, but to encouraging your own story and encouraging your own giftedness. For example, adults, even, even 30, 40 years ago, used to believe that all kids were their kids. That wasn't just limited to ancient cultures. 40 years ago, uh, a young person in need would be seen as someone that everybody in a community would at least... Uh, in their best days, think that, that we got to take care of the kid. Those of you old enough or have seen Nick at Night, uh, do you remember Dennis the Menace TV show? Is a great example of that. Because Mr. Wilson reluctantly cared for Dennis. And Dennis would go into his house anytime he wanted to in the back. There was just this relationship with a next door neighbor, which is all but gone, or would, it would be a very different TV show today. Uh, and it would probably be more like a CSI than anything else. <laughs> Adults used to see their primary role as facilitating children becoming adults. Um, the concept of legacy has always been, historically, and even 30, 40 years ago, of passing on a story, of passing on what's meaningful in life. And legacy is now limited to just financial. It's passing on what I work hard to earn and passing it on to my own kids. Uh, the the, the furor related to um, the politicization of whose kids belong to whom the last probably two months, if you watched MSNBC versus Fox News, uh, you know, and they love going at each other. But there was a, there was a and, I, and I used to keep it on, but I'm going to try to go fast, uh, a person from MSNBC that talked about how all these kids belong to all of us because for all of time, even in American society up till about 30, 40 years ago, that was just like an obvious thing. Of course all the kids belong to all of us. And yet, boy, some, some folks from the other side of the ideological spectrum jumped on that and said, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do with my kids. And it's just a, it's a unique way in human history how to look at young people. And I'm not trying to politicize this at all. This is not a political thing. This is a shift in our viewpoint of young people. Adults once saw kids as assets, not liabilities, and they were worth the effort we put into it. If you ask a teacher 40 years ago, a public school teacher, uh, what do you do? Well, I teach. You do? What do you teach? Well, I, I teach high school kids. I, I teach English, but I teach high school students. If you ask a, a, a coach 40 years ago, what do you do? I'm a, I'm a coach and a history teacher. Oh, yeah. What do you coach? I coach student athletes. Yeah, I coach football, but I'm, I'm coaching these great kids. They're amazing. Today, you ask a teacher, try it. What do you teach? English. What do you coach? Basketball. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, if you ask a teacher, <clears throat> in fact, this could happen. This did happen when I was in high school. Is uh, Maybe three girls would go up to their uh, Spanish teacher and say, you know, we've got a JV volleyball game. Love it if you'd come. And almost for sure, that Spanish teacher 
would give up the afternoon to go watch the JV volleyball game, which, by the way, is a painful experience. <laughs> Especially in those days, because that's before volleyball. You couldn't get a point unless you served in those days. Do you know that? And so JV volleyball games would last three, you know, four days. These suckers, <laughs> net, um, yay, okay, net. I mean, they're just... And she wouldn't have gone reluctantly with a cell phone, because obviously you didn't have cell phones then, or bringing papers or other work to do. Now there's texting, there's I showed up for 10 minutes, aren't I a cool person because I took 10 minutes out of my day because I got 160 students and there's so much expectations, I'm exhausted. I'm not blaming teachers. I'm talking about the system of our society where you get in a helicopter. This is one example of where she would be there simply because she was there for kids. And a coach, after the game, a practice was over and could see something going on with a kid, would sit in the stands or the locker room after practice to spend a half an hour 40 years ago to talk to a kid about, hey, I'm noticing something. Are you okay? What's going on? Well, you know, my dad's been traveling a lot, and he and my mom are kind of, well, talk, tell me about that. And here's a way you can actually do cultural studies, is now we have movies and sitcoms, obviously, from the, from the past 30, 40, 50 years, and you can go back, and you, you can watch TV shows, like there was a Leave it to Beaver episode on when I had my knee replacement. You would never know that. You would think I must be just an amazing physical specimen, but I am, but you've got to redefine amazing to actually go there. Uh, the, but, I, but I was kind of laid up on a lot of Vicodin, and so I'm watching anything I possibly could because I couldn't read and couldn't focus, and there was a Leave it to Beaver uh, one of those marathons. Can you imagine? I mean, yes, I, I, for research purposes only. And, but there was an episode where Wally, the oldest brother, and Leave the Beaver, 1959, 60, 61, something like that, had, had, there was a struggle going on. And so the teacher called Wally's mom, June, I think June, right? And, uh, and said, oh, hi. And she says, hi, they're friends. And, boy, I'm really worried about Wally. Is he doing okay? Not the teacher that's mad or going to, you know, it's nothing like it is today. And she goes, well, I got an idea. We're not really sure if anything's going on. Why don't you come over to dinner? And when Wally comes home, we'll just sit and have dinner together. And I'm thinking, that is weird, man. And, <laughs> and then and when Wally came in and he saw the teacher with his mom, dad, and the beef sitting there, and he didn't go, oh, he said, oh, hi, and sits down to eat. I'm thinking, can you imagine now? If a high school junior walks in to go, and his English teacher's sitting there with his mom and dad, kind of, okay, got to go, you know, I'm out of here. It was just a different world. And it was a different world where educators and coaches and people in churches and faith communities and the neighborhood just all kind of saw themselves rallying around young people. That's essentially what has shifted. See, adults used to be there for kids more than mere presence or driving. I do a lot of parent seminars uh, that have come out of the work that I've done. Uh, my wife's a marriage and family therapist, and so we've written a book called Disconnected, which is kind of taking the hurt stuff and put it into parents. And so like last week, I was in a place called Sammamish, Washington, which is where Microsoft is in Redmond, Sammamish there. And there's like 50,000 employees of Microsoft right there in the town. And they've had six suicides in the two high schools in 18 months. So it became a news thing, and you know, all, the, all the TV stations were there, and it was kind of a big deal. Uh, and I just was trying to there to describe what it used to be like for kids. They had places to go. They had people that knew their names and stories. And virtually that's been not only eroded, but ripped away from kids. The, the more we have, have fragmented our society and the systems that were set up originally to care for young people, in order to provide this kind of uh, surrounding mechanism of support and encouragement as they try to figure out individuation, has eroded to becoming much more about reinforcing performance and conformity for kids. It's such a rare adult that actually knows the names of the young people in your churches. Much less after church says, hey, you know what, I'd love to, do you, do you go to Starbucks to drink coffee or something like that? I would love to be able to just have a cup of coffee with you for half an hour or something like that. Did you ask your folks if that would be okay? Maybe get a friend. and let's just I just want to get to know you. How often does that happen? But 30, 40 years ago, they did know each other. 
Now you got to make a specific appointment and there's legal issues and there's all kind of stuff on top of it. I'm sure you guys are aware of it. Let me give you an example. That's the first Little League team. I love that slide. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. They, th that boy right there, I don't know if you can see on this thing, you can't. He's got the bat. Look, he's just smiling. He's very excited. He's got the bat. She's holding up the ball. She's very excited. 1938. Uh, boys and girls from roughly 7 to 16 years old, they let that little boy wear a dress. They were very progressive back then. Um, and what's interesting about this period, what, what do you notice? Okay, haircuts, similar. Yeah, okay, is that really the first thing you notice? Mary, I, I'm not really going to open it up again. They're, okay, they're smiling, most of them, sure. Think about a Little League picture you've seen. Yes. There's no uniforms that say Sally's Cafe. <laughs> Sally didn't get Jack for helping out this thing. <laughs> but what else do you notice? Who's not in the picture? The coach. There's no adult in spandex. <laughs> I want to, in heaven, I, I hope heaven is so much more marvelously surprising than anything we ever experienced. But I, I hope they have a vast DVD library because I want to see, I want to see the, the first Little League coach to think it was cool to wear a baseball uniform to coach Little League kids. I want to see him come down the stairs and say, honey, what do you think? What do you think? Baseball uniform, I'm a coach of Little League. I mean, it's bad enough when you have actually adults wearing baseball uniforms to manage a team. I mean, it, it, can you imagine, you know, a college basketball coach, Calhoun, okay, we're in Connecticut, you know, wearing a basketball uniform on the sideline, standing there, okay, pass the ball to that guy. But baseball, you know, when did it become about adults? But see, this just was one example. Youth sports has become about adults, has become about parents, has become about coaches. We coach kids who are young kids and if they can't cut it then they move on but we've built this machine this system known as sports if the third best basketball player in the history of the nba michael jordan maybe you've heard of him right second best lebron james of course and i'm from la so kobe we won't even talk about him right now okay so but if michael jordan had grown up in this culture today michael jordan never would have played professional basketball because in his town, he never would have been able to go to college and play basketball. You know why? Because he never would have been able to make the high school team because he didn't play club sport in junior high. Because he wasn't any good until he's about a junior in high school. Because bodies develop differently for children and adolescents. And we got this trend now where college coaches are scouting elementary school and middle school kids and trying to sign them. Yeah, absolutely. And in most and even in Connecticut, believe it or not, in, in this enlightened part of the world, Connecticut, <laughs> and in, as far as you guys are concerned, this is amazingly enlightened. As far as the rest of the country, it's another conversation <laughs> altogether. But, um, but it's, it's, it's like here, it, it, this idea that it's just, it is what it is. That's what every adult says. It is what it is. There's nothing we can do. That eight-year-old has to play competitive soccer because they want to. An eight-year-old doesn't know what they want to do 10 minutes from now. They're playing, you know, Xbox. Do you want to play competitive soccer? Sure, it'd be great. Okay, it's a big commitment. Okay, I'm committed. <laughs> 11 to 12-year-olds do not understand the necessity of playoffs. ABC, ESPN are the ones that are driving the expansion of the Little League World Series deal. And we we make a big deal about that. Last summer, there was one particular deal where they showed an, a, an Asian kid, I forgot what country, and they freeze-framed in the last inning of one of the semifinals. He dropped the ball, his team lost, and they freeze-framed him crying with the tears going down the black face. And they freeze-framed it, and they thought it was a dramatic moment. But this is an 11-year-old kid that dropped a baseball. And you know what? I guarantee you they were TiVoing or the equivalent of it in his town, in his nation, his friends, his family. So for the rest of his life, the freeze frame of him crying and him failing, and he's 11, and nobody says, you gotta be kidding me. How dare we? When did we allow adults to shame kids on sideline of a sport? But we do, it's normal. It, but see, I'm talking again, helicopter, system. It's the system has become 
about us as opposed to who kids are and what they developmentally need. I saw this in a restaurant not long ago. Teenagers, tired of being hassled by your stupid parents? Act now. Get out, and move, move out, get a job, pay your own bills while you still know everything. If only kids were different, if only kids would step up, if only kids would be responsible, if only kids would quit talking back, if only kids would not be so needy, if only kids would just get with it. Well, this is a generation that has experienced um, pain. Denise Clark Pope, Stanford University, she and a woman named uh, Madeline Levine, I recommend you, to, if you're interested in this stuff, Madeline Levine's written a book called Price of Privilege. For you in this part of the country, it would be good for you to read her. She's got a new book. I forgot the name of it. Developmental psychologist, uh, pra practicing clinical psychologist. Instead of fostering a student's traits of honesty, she's working with Denise Clark Pope. Integrity, cooperation, respect. The school may be promoting deception, hostility, and anxiety. It's a machine. And it's a machine of data transmission. We no longer are committed to taking data and infusing knowledge that leads to wisdom. Education now is about data transmission and test scores and a kind of bottom line uh, stratification. When the reality is oh, for all of time education has been about healthy socialization to prepare kids to enter adulthood. And wisdom, not just knowledge and not even just data. Social capital, here's what Robert Putnam says. He refers to it as the connections among individuals, including social networks and norms of reciprocity and trustworthiness. It's the idea that social networks matter. And this is uh, James Field's major uh, work called Social Capital. The central thesis of social capital theory is that relationships matter, and that's what's dismantled in our culture. Chris Corsi, this is worth thriving. This institute, Adolescent Faith and Flourishing. The concept of th flourishing and thriving are related to positive psychology, which is more a hopeful way to go after helping young people and all people to somehow discover a sense of, of satisfaction in living life at the deepest level. And a lot of the thriving scholars, even at Fuller Seminary where I teach, we have a Thrive Institute there. We put a lot of money. We've got a top-notch Oxford scholar who's heading it up. And the thriving so often says kids have these unlimited potential. They've got so much to offer. Let's help our kids thrive. And I completely agree with that. But this is also at the center of this theory of thriving. Attachments are the necessary building blocks for our lives. Attachments are the foundation for emotional and mental well-being and interpersonal interaction. How we grow and mature is based on the quality of our bonds. Without an attachment foundation built on consistent, healthy interaction, our emotional well-being and mental health will suffer. That is the state of mid-adolescence in America. That is the problem. Our kids are having a hard time thriving because nobody's there. Synonyms for this idea of social capital, capital is used a lot as scaffolding. Maybe you'll read that certain places. That's what psychologists use a lot, the idea of scaffolding around kids. Assets, search institute. If we give kids assets, but assets without us is nothing. And attachment. Attachment is this idea that there's a relational social bond. As a society, we've effectively dismantled social capital and have thereby enabled the systemic abandonment of our kids. I figured in an academic institution that's offering this, I wanted to give you some academic heft to realize what this is all about. Is that the brain researchers are saying you can't have healthy development unless you have attachment bonds because the brain develops because of the social environment. That's why there's extended adolescence because there's, no, there's not enough social bonding for kids. And I call it systemic abandonment. It's not systematic abandonment of kids. Because systematic abandonment of kids means, hey, let's get coaches and teachers together and a bunch of parents and let's get in a room and go, how can we hurt our kids? That's systematic. That's not what's going on. It's not a conspiracy. The NSA is not involved in this, as best I know. <laughs> what this is about is the systems that were originally designed to reinforce and support young people going through adolescence 
have become about adults and they become machines and boxes where we put our kids in and say perform and conform. Three ways that kids find their sense of self in the society. How they perform, how they, per how they conform, and they can, if they have the ability to project an image that will somehow please an adult in charge of the system. Objectivity, I mean, um, objectification, making a human being an object is alive and well in 2013. And there's, there was in the New York Times on Saturday, I didn't actually get it in the end of the slides, but I saw it in, if you saw Saturday's New York Times, uh, there's an op-ed piece that talked about the devastating consequences of what it means to grow up in this culture and the end of it. And something like, I forgot the percentage, but it's like 27% of high school girls have been sexually assaulted. And that, that is, by the most rigid standard of what sexual assault is, I would say it's more like the 80 to 90% range, depending on how you define sexual assault. And yet, that's the underbelly of this society where Thomas Friedman and David Brooks and others have said, it's now the atomization of society. We're not even fragmented anymore. It's not like chunks of people. It's atomization. We're all atoms. It's amazing they still show up at church. But the reality is our kids are growing up in a vacuum of social relationships and support. And I call that systemic abandonment of our young, <clears throat> even in the family. Unfortunately, in the family, uh, which, which is kind of the last bastion of the social contract to kids, that has eroded. Um, it, it, Forty years ago, you ask a third grader to draw a picture of their family tree, most of them would be able to do it in class. This is not meant to be humorous. It's meant to be descriptive. And Brock, you'll remember this picture. Uh, if you ask them to do it today, that's maybe what they would end up drawing. But here's the point, is if a kid... Even a kid in this family system has been raised to expect this over the course of their lifetime. That even in the family, you can't necessarily count on which grandma's going to show up at Christmas. You're not even sure who's going to be around. Ron Taffel, by the way, a great writer, sociologist, wrote Childhood Unbound. Regardless of helicopter, uh, headlines labeling us helicopter dads or soccer moms, in many ways parents seem almost invisibly removed. 21st century parent managers negotiating every single logistical challenge in their kids' cramped schedules became too frenetically busy to be a magnetic presence in the internal landscape of a child's world. I love that line. That's why I use this. A magnetic presence in the internal landscape of a child's word world. Even the brain studies are confirming that kids are desperate for a magnetic presence. And without that, it's very difficult for the brain to fully develop into the maturation it requires. Again, let's blame kids. It's their problem. They need to get at it. They need to be more responsible. Okay, <clears throat> why this must matter to the church the cost for our kids, and that's why I'm just going to take a couple minutes here to talk about this. This is basically my research, Hurt. Hurt 2.0. Um, a lot of you didn't, when I first stood up, you probably didn't ever heard of me. You didn't know I wrote anything. All you saw was I was attractive. That's all you really had to go on. <laughs> I don't know why that's the biggest laugh of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs> but some of you, obvious, thanks, Karen. Yeah. And, but some of you probably said, well, I, I recognize that guy. Yes, I started my literary career actually as a cover model. That's where it actually began. Um, that's where it started. So maybe you remember that. Uh, but the book Hurt and Hurt 2.0 is basically unpacking the cost to kids in their own experience. For example, they live in a world beneath the surface. By the time they hit abstraction, right around ninth grade, they realize that, whoa, whoa, this is a little precarious. So they grab onto each other and they go underneath. They're a different population. They're a different group. To, to understand them, theoretically, we have to see them as a subpopulation, as almost an immigrant group trying to figure out how to connect. I used to use the word assimilation, but I've been schooled mostly by uh, my own students who have said assimilation is not necessarily a positive thing. Because assimilation means you've got to change to become part of us. That's what most churches do with kids. 
and I use a different word. I'll talk to you about that in a second. Uh, then they live out of multiple selves, multiple identities. Uh, what, what that actually means is uh, if you don't know who you are, you're not sure what kind of power you have, and you don't know who cares, and you go to the world beneath, you realize you go into English, you got to be somebody. This is for high school, this is mid adolescence. And so you create a self for, high school, for English. Then you create another self for math, which is why parents will go to teachers' conferences and hear about six different kids and go, that's just weird. But the reality is it's because they don't have a core self to draw from yet. It's not like us who compartmentalize as adults. They actually have a church self. And that church self, that self they create for the various social environments, that self is created in order for them to survive that particular setting or box. They don't necessarily know what's going on. They don't really know what's going on, but they know they have to do it. They've got to be a certain way or they're not going to be accepted in that setting. And what we do is we, we reinforce the box of expectation and performance in the church. Because we say we love you, but really we love you, but we'll really love you if you look this way and act this way and talk this way and you perform according to our expectations. And that's why kids leave right around the middle of 10th grade if they've stuck around that long, mostly. If they haven't found an environment that says you simply get to be you here, then they'll stay, especially if they have a sense of place. But if it's one more agenda, if it's one more expectation, shove them into the youth room, parade them up in front once a year for the youth service, and that's all there is to it. It's a bunch of a, a few adults that are volunteering or trying to help out, and kids just kind of come through the machine of the youth ministry program because they're supposed to have kids. They know I'm not of value here. It's one more box I've got to jump into, and frankly, this is a volunteer box. I can get out of it when I'm 16 years old, and they're gone. The ones that stick around have found some sense of satisfaction by being there. And it's either you've done a great job of creating a safe place and inclusion and value, or it's the only place they have of safety. Think about your juniors, uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors you have now. Either you've done a great job of helping them to know how deeply cared for they are and how valued they are, or they don't have any place else where they're going to get as much accolades for what they do. And I, I'm positive that every one of your churches has a few of those kids that they, the reason they're sticking around is because somehow it, 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 at least it, it's still a role, but it's still the safety that I feel here. And you've got to make the shift from just having to be the most available sense of safety in terms of a box into a place of actual inclusion. See, the key is, and you're, we're getting to the crescendo, the key is, how do we actually allow a kid to contribute and be part of us? How do we help them to know that just because everybody else tells you you've got to conform and perform, you don't have to do that. We want you. You matter. You are part of me. I can't live as a guy in his 50s without a 14-year-old that comes alongside of me and gives me the blessing of their own life and giftedness. I need that kid, and that kid needs me. You need that kid, and your senior adults need that kid. The problem is, when adults aren't the initiators, they expect kids to step up and be the initiators, and they just can't do that. They're not prepared to do that. Susan Harder, pr professor at the University of Denver, she writes this, Adolescents develop a proliferation of selves that will vary as a function of the social context. These include self with father, mother, close friend, romantic partner, peers, as well as a self in the role of student on the job as an athlete. A critical developmental task of adolescence, therefore, is the construction of multiple selves in different roles and relationships. And let me tell you something. This is the most exhausting thing that they can do because they got to keep running. Your kids are exhausted. And they are working really hard. And they're working at stuff that we, we want them to work at this stuff, and this is the... This is the core self-developmental issues that they're working at. And here's what's worse, is our best kids are probably most at risk because they learn to adapt. They, they learn how to adapt. Denise Clark Pope, again, successful students learn to devise various strategies to stay ahead of their peers and to please those in power positions. Unsuccessful students, for a variety of reasons, were not as adept at playing the survival game. Read the book Outlier by Malcolm Gladwell to understand this term. 
Malcolm Gladwell. Basically, he says that our best people are the ones that have been given the environment, the opportunity, and the adult presence for them to really flourish. And what we've done is, is kids that are, that are, that everybody says, that's an amazing kid, it's because they have learned how to adapt to the ways that they're going to get accolades for what they're doing. And there's a lot of kids that fall through the cracks. And that happens in the church all the time. There's certain kids we praise ever since they were two years old. And there's other kids that kind of come up and we go, yeah, that's the prototype. And even if we don't say it with our mouth, we say it with our attitude and our faces. And all the other kids see that, and if they can't figure out how to weasel their way into our hearts, then they don't get any attention and they're gone. And peers and friendships have changed. Here's something that uh, we, we look at high school kids and we see, well, it's just like when we were in high school, they have their friends. Now, and if you're 35 and older, your friendship groups were what's called a clique. It's like you linking arms with each other, right, in a circle. And, you, and that's, a, that's a friendship group that you need to survive. As adults, I hope you have good friends, a few of them. And you link arms and you circle up. Even Jesus had Peter, James, and John. Remember when he went up to the Mountain Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John? Yay, great. Uh, can you imagine Bartholomew at the fire? Hey, hey, where, where are you going, Lord? Oh, we're just going to go up this little mount, little transfiguration thing. It's not a big deal. Just once you stay there, we're just going to go up. You know, Bartholomew's dad emailed Joseph right after that. <laughs> God, Joseph really came down hard on Jesus for just how, you only have three friends. You should have taken Bartholomew with you on that little camping trip. That's bad. But now, see, in, 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 in mid-adolescence, they have these, they have friendship groups, but they're not the same as our friendship groups. You're 35 and older. See, mid-adolescent is so consumed with survival that they're, even their friendship groups are networks of mutual self-protection. See, that's on your outline. They, it's like they link arms still, but they link arms back to back now. The whole concept of wingman didn't just come from Top Gun. But it's an idea that my friends are there to protect and guard me and to provide me a sense of joy and celebration in life. The problem is there's certain rules in the peer group known as the cluster where the peer group you can't bring your friends down. You can't, you can't really talk about the deeper stuff that's incongruous that you don't understand whether it's family structure, uh, struggles or addiction issues or cutting or loneliness or insecurity. You don't talk about that with your friends. Maybe one or two friends and girls are better at this than guys. But the point of the friendship group is to protect you from dealing with the hassles of life, not to be a support group. So guess what? This is the loneliest generation in history. There's more freedoms and a whole lot more danger out there. Kids are playing hockey and lacrosse. This is serious stuff. We've got to do something and they're stressed. This is the most stressed generation in the world. This is, uh, people are stressed, or again, David Elkind. In a word, egocentric, though not necessarily conceited or prideful. See, it's not our kids' fault. They have little opportunity to consider the needs and interests of others because they are under intense stress. <clears throat> Here's what they said in our research. The pressure causes you to put on a good face. You can't be weak. You gotta, you'll become one of those kids. So much pressure to succeed. Teachers expect me to be perfect. Kids not in the elite group feel like they're nothing. You have to bring your A game every day. Um, in my research, the today's adolescents are the most stressed generation in history, and I don't think there's even a question about that. The loneliness most isolated and the most stressed ever because they just don't have anybody there in a highly complex performance-oriented and competitive and individualistic society. And then we're the church. We offer support. We offer youth ministry. We offer youth groups. We offer sports. We offer drama. We offer dance. We take them on mission trips. We have all kinds of great opportunities for kids, but we just don't give ourselves away. And we're the church. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? If we don't have compassion for our young to pass faith on from generation to generation, that means we don't read the Psalms. That means we don't realize that Jesus said, if you want to be great, look at this little kid. Okay, bottom line, here we go. Now, it's, it's 1124, I got six minutes. But it's relatively obvious now. 
is when they're a child and an early adolescent, they need relationships that are gentle. Paul talk, uses this as a metaphor, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he says, like a mother, like a nursing mother, we were gentle among you. We loved you so much, we gave you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. So dear you had become to us. Gentleness is not an attribute of this society. And even for children. But as children in early adolescence, everybody's got to be gentle with them. Then when they move into adolescence, they need relationships that are supportive. Again, 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul says, Like a father, we were there to encourage, comfort, and urge you to live lives worthy of God. Encourage and comfort is the biblical metaphor for fathering. We think of... Um, you got a lot of images. I'm going to keep going. And relationships that are mutual as they approach adulthood. Philippians 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You belong to each other. John 15, I have one command, city slickers. Remember that? One thing. Love one another. Exactly. That's it. That's the game. Our vocation is to love one another and be his ambassadors and witnesses to God's movement in the world, to bring shalom, to restore that which was broken. That's the point of the church. It doesn't matter where you are on the theological spectrum. We all agree with that one. Evangelization is both sharing the good news of Christ and being a witness to that and serving the needs of those who are broken. Our kids are broken. And that's, that's what they need. Well, when there are holes in the net, what we look to is let's have youth ministry and get a youth minister. Let's get them trained. If it's bad enough, you get a therapist. If it's not bad enough, you get an SAT tutor. Right? <laughs> or you get a small group leader. Or you get a youth minister. Or, uh, but if you get one person, then we have these mentoring programs. In a world of systemic abandonment, where it's the most stressed and loneliest generation in history, we're going to get a we're going to get a mentor. One, we're going to hire them. Oh, better yet, we're going to get a paid friend for you, kid. We love you so much. <laughs> Thank you. See the point? When in reality, let's think theologically here. Who we are as the church? Okay, let's get some people that actually are trained in this stuff. And let's have them pour into kids' lives. But let's also allow families and encourage families to come together and love one another's kids. And then maybe let's get extended family and a teacher coach or small group or a senior pastor or a 75-year-old widower in the church. Let's all start recognizing that our kids need a bunch of adults. And why not in the church we make this the goal of youth ministry? That's my vocational journey is to get the church to be the church for kids. That youth ministry has way too long counted on a paid person or a bunch of volunteers to pour into kids' lives because the church refuses to do it. And those days are gone. Basically, it's called adoption. Uh, instead of assimilating kids into the church, oh, you get to be with us. You get to listen to the new organ that you would have voted down. <laughs> but we adopt kids. See, anybody that's in an adoptive setting... You adopt children or you've been adopted or you know folks in that. The system has to change to receive the person being included. That's supremely important. It's both theological and psychosocial. The system of the church must adapt to receive the new generation. Every generation has forced the church to adapt in order to pass faith on in the contextual realities of that generation coming up. What that means is our adults, yes, we talked a little bit about, I forgot your name, I'm sorry, Ann. Ann and I talked about a lot of senior adults are grieving the loss of what used to be in the church. We need to help them grieve, but we also need to help them grow up and realize that legacy for them is that they, they adopt these kids. And we, we have to train them how to do that. So therefore, here's my five things and I'm done. Perfect, i got two minutes. But it's obvious. I've said it all along. One, the church becomes a youth minister. That the body of Christ, however you guys frame that, 
in your own tradition, however you frame what the church is meant to be, still there's this core identity that's related to God who has revealed himself. And I'm sorry to use the male pronoun. But the, the Creator has re revealed the Creator to all of us. And therefore, as the people who, of God who gather together to worship and celebrate and then represent that God in the world, we have to train adults to be the people that care for the next generation. Not only in the church, but in the community and the world. Justice demands that we care about kids even if they're not our own children. And I know that that resonates with many of your traditions here. Secondly, then a default is they need to know what kids are going through. Instead of blaming them, they need to have compassion. That's the third. Compassion comes from two Latin words, cum pati, which means to suffer with. We need not just to tell a bunch of adults and senior adults and people on our church councils and our pastoral staff, you need to love a kid. That's meaningless. You need to demonstrate a suffering with a kid. You need to initiate relationships with them. Fifth, fourth, we need to encourage and build authentic community where kids are included. We need to figure out how to get adults and kids to come together. And that's not this particular talk. If they're going to have me, I'm going to come back and talk about sticky faith, but another time. But just to basically give you the, ground, the framework of this. If you have an authentic community and invite kids to the table, Matthew 22, the kingdom of God is a party, as Tony Campolo wrote a book on that. It's a wedding feast. And Jews knew how to throw, throw a wedding feast, man, in those days. It's not an eternal um, Amy Grant concert. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right? It is a, 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 just an amazing blowout banquet celebration for all generations to share together. Last thing. Mentoring community. <clears throat> mentoring community means you don't get mentors for kids because almost no adult feels qualified to do it, wants to do it. Any adult that wants to be a mentor to kid, you don't let them, okay? Get a background check, <laughs> watch them carefully, okay? Because any, I mean, any adult that goes, oh, please, let me, I just want a mentor. Eee. But we're not even called to be mentors. We're called to mentor one another. Because actually an 8-year-old and a 14-year-old and a 23-year-old have unbelievable gifts and talents and insights to provide to the whole church community. And, and, and a 45-year-old and, and a 65-year-old and an 80-year-old, they're not done. They think they're done. What do they have to offer? They have to offer the gift of their longevity, their history, their understanding of faith and life, their ability to bless and not curse. I mean, they bring so much to the table. And when we get, we get ourselves, where we get them all mixed together, here's the key, though. Adults have to be the initiators because kids don't trust adults to care. These five things, to me, are the antidote to systemic abandonment in the church. So thank you for listening and letting me have at you guys. I'm done. Thank you.